You don't want that either? It feels awkward. Okay. Did you push play yet? Yes, sir. All right, so we're rolling on section five. Section five is England. All right, so we're talking about talking about England right here. Put your stuff away, Spry. And we're going to talk about absolute monarchs and a transition away from absolute monarchs. Okay. Again, what were the causes and the effects of absolutism in Europe, 1500, 1800? In England, we're starting out talking about absolute monarchs, and then uh, a revolution, and then a restoration, and then a glorious revolution. Okay? Now, here's a timeline. This is right, you don't have to write this is in your in your notes, but this is a very interesting timeline. Keep in mind, one of the problems in England was always this Protestant Catholic thing, right? Um, Anglican Church. But all these royals were either Catholic or they were Protestant. And, uh, and this is a problem here. So James I, he came from, um, he came from um, Scotland. He became the king of England. Keep it rule. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Well, uh, right now I'm in the middle of a, a lecture. But... but um, I'm, Oh, okay. Well, well, no, because I because she does such a good job when she's my setup. Okay. okay. You're recording. You're recording. That's okay. That's, things happen. Okay. All right. So Charles came from Scotland, and so he was the, he was the first uh, king of both Scotland and England. So, all right. Anyway. Um, when he died, his son took over Charles I. He clashed with Parliament. There was an English Civil War. He was executed. Okay? Now, I'll cover that a little bit more here, but that was the deal. A guy named Oliver Cromwell took over. He was the rebel leader. Okay? He was a military dictator. He was, he was really bad, but he didn't get executed. He just died. After he died, the people in England said, we need a king again. Let's go get Charles II. And I'll tell you more about that later. Uh, and that was called the Restoration. So circle the word Restoration, circle the word English Civil War, and then after Charles died, James II, and his son, came to be the king, but son of a, he was Catholic, and you know these Protestants, they didn't like Catholics, so all right, there was a problem there. So the, the, good, the good Protestant um, nobility of England uh, called William and Mary over there, living over in the Netherlands, and said, hey, can you come be our king and queen? And they did. All right. Now, all right, so let's start off. First of all, 1603, James I became the king of England. Uh, he was also the king of Scotland, so that was a union right there. They, that was a good deal. All right. He still struggled with Parliament over money. Remember, at this time, Parliament had quite a bit of Parliament had more power than any other representative body in any other parts of Europe, so they had some power. The king had to ask them for money. All right. Um, they also Parliament also wanted more church reform. James was Protestant, but his idea of church was to make it kind of look a lot like Catholic Church, and Parliament didn't like that because most of them in Parliament were non-Catholic Puritans. Okay, so um, all right, so James. James died. His son Charles took over. He became the king in 1625. He also had some arguments with Parliament over money. Okay, um, and they forced him to sign the Petition of Right. Now, when you circle the word Petition of Right, just know that it limited the power of the king. And this is kind of an overall theme in England for several hundred years. Was every so often Parliament or the nobles would get the king to sign some kind of document limiting the power of the king. And it started in 1215 with the Magna Carta. Petition of Right was just another one. But Charles was still what type of monarch? Still an absolute monarch. So he didn't abide by it. Okay, So he ignored, the, ignored that. So they had a civil war. Now, um, Civil War started in basically 1642, and 
it lasted either between five and seven years, really depending on how you look at it. Um, but the result was that they ended up uh, having a trial for the king and saying that he did things that was against England, and then they executed him. Now, this was the first time, really, kind of really the first time in history that a king had been like put on trial and executed. I mean, the king's the leader of the country. You don't put the leader of the country on trial and execute him. So it scared a lot of other kings around Europe. Um, but that's just what happened. All right. All right, so Oliver Cromwell, you can circle him. He was the guy that took over his group of Puritans. Um, they fought the war against the, uh, the royalists, the ones that supported the king, and, uh, and they won. All right, let's keep moving. All right, so Oliver Cromwell, he abolishes the monarchy. He, be he became the dictator, basically, because he was the, the general. He abolished the monarchy, he said, no, no more king. And he also abolished the House of Lords. The House of Lords was, was half a parliament. That was the landowning types. Okay. Um, oh, he also suppressed a rebellion in Ireland, and you know the Irish people didn't like that. But the English have been really bad to the Irish since about 1200, so... That's just the way it goes. Uh, also, when they took over, these Puritans had this idea of morality that was kind of new, and they wanted people to do, th but like, not sin. And so they had all these things. They started listing things as a sin, you know, like gambling and um, and uh, dancing, and uh, and some yeah, like footloose music. Yeah. And uh, just other things that they considered to be sinful activities. Um, all right, so Cromwell died. It was one of those deals where Cromwell was sick, and people were just kind of waiting for him to die, because this civil war, like a lot of civil wars, seemed like a great idea at the time. But sometimes it's, well, I'll just say it's a lot easier to be a critic than to be a ruler, Cromwell was a much better critic than he was a ruler, and, and that's, that's just the way it goes. So people just kind of waited him out, and then he finally died. Um, and then, after he died, Parliament said, you know what, we really need a king. Um, not to be an absolute monarch like Charles I or James I, but hey, we've got to have a king. Everybody's got one. We've got to have one too. So <laughs> they called Charles II. Or they didn't call him, they just sent some people to invite him, I guess. So, like, in my mind, here's kind of the way it went. Charles II was hanging out someplace in northern Scotland, and he was hanging out there because he didn't want to die like his dad did. Spry? Um, it says on your PowerPoint That was his son. Charles I was the one that they cut his head off, Okay. His son Charles II was hanging out in Scotland. We okay, dude? <laughs> yeah. yeah. All right. Slow it. So Charles II, he was hanging out in some swampy castle in northern Scotland, and um, and the people in England, the nobility, wanted him to be the king. So the way I. It, what? Yeah, he was kind of hiding out because remember they executed his dad, so he thought, yeah, he better stay away from England, right? He was hanging out. Okay, so all right. Anyway, one day some guys show up from Parliament and they were like, uh, "Hey, you're Charles the first son, Charles," and he's like, "Yeah, um, you didn't come here to kill me or anything." They're like, "No, actually, we want you to be our king." So. You know, it, it always strikes me very strange that, that this guy was hanging out in a swamp and all of a sudden he becomes the king of England after they cut his dad's head off a few years before. But, you know, it's hard for us to understand royalty and kings and stuff like that. And there's probably more to it than just that. That's just the way I envision the story going. So Charles II became the king in what's called the Restoration. Restoration means the, the uh, monarchy was restored. Now, they also made Charles sign... Some stuff like every time somebody gets to be a king, the, the parliament kind of makes them sign something. So he signed uh, something that's it's a law, but we refer to it as habeas corpus. And habeas corpus is a Latin word that says 
show me the body. Okay? So, anyway, what it really means is this. Um, you, if you are put in jail, the government has to tell you why you are put in jail. Okay, now it's easy for us as Americans, right? Because we see it on TV all the time on all the cop and robber shows. A guy gets arrested, they have to tell him, we're arresting you for such and such. You've got 24 hours, you've got to tell him why you're arresting him. But before this idea of habeas corpus, if the king didn't like you, he's put you in jail, he just forgot about you. You never came to trial. So the nobles wanted this. All right, so that was a big deal. Now, um, James II came along. He became the next king in 1685. Charles, he was Charles' brother. Now, the bad thing about James, Simmons, the bad thing about James was he was Catholic. And everybody in England at this time was like Protestant, no cat. we don't want a Catholic. In fact, they even kind of had a law that said you really shouldn't be a Catholic and be a king of England. They expected you to convert to Anglican church and all that. Anyway, um... He became the king of England, and it doesn't really talk about it much in your book, but people were, they were ready to just wait him out, too. They were like, he's got no kids. Like, this guy, he's kind of old, he's got no kids, he's going to die, and when he dies, we'll get a Protestant king. Let's, we don't want another civil war, we don't want anything bad happening. And all of a sudden, this old guy, he's got this young wife, and she all of a sudden, she starts having babies, and she has a male Baby, she was Catholic too. That means the next king was going to be Catholic, and the nobles were like, look, we can wait this guy out, but we can't wait his son. We could have another 80 years of Catholicism. We're not doing it. Let's find us another king. So they sent some ambassadors over to, to the Netherlands, and they found, <clears throat> they found some people to be their king and queen, and they called it the Glorious Revolution. And the Glorious Revolution were when William and Mary were invited to come invade England. And they came and invaded England. It's called the Glorious Revolution because it was bloodless. Mary was, um, the, uh, was the daughter of Charles II, so she was, she was Protestant, and her husband was Protestant, and they lived in an area called Orange. Little area. He was the Prince of Orange. She was the Princess of Orange, and they were hanging out in Orange Land. And again, it's one of those deals where... Noble showed up one day and said, hey, hey, Bill, Martha, would you like to come and be the king and queen of England? And they looked around at Orange and said, hmm, nice little place. England, great place. Sure, we'll come invade your country. What will it take? Ah, just get about a 1,000 guys. Just come and march over here. We'll help you. That's what they did. So they went from being in Orange to England just in a short period of time. So good deal. But, again... A king comes in, parliament makes him limit the power. All right, so what did they have to do? They signed a Bill of Rights. This was the English Bill of Rights. Hang with me on that. We just got a couple minutes. Our Bill of Rights in America was based on a lot of the same stuff in their Bill of Rights as in our Bill of Rights. But the bottom line is that it limited the power of the monarchy. They also developed a cabinet system. I don't have a question on the test about the cabinet system. But they had to get people to help them rule, and that's what they did. All right, that's the end. Push stop, please.